about it and, and was it possible that the diversity was actually encoded in the genome or was it something that was generated during differentiation of cells? It, in, when I was an undergraduate, no one had cloned antibody loci, so we couldn't look at the sequence and tell. Um, obviously, in the last 30 years or so, people have done that, so it, it's now possible to um, take a plasma cell, grow it up, uh, clone the antibody lockers from that plasma cell, sequence it, and, and, and see what's there, and, and compare lots of different plasma cells uh, and lots of different stem cells, progenitor cells, and, and try and figure out actually what's going on. Um, and it turns out that the answer to this question, is the diversity encoded in the genome, or is it generated during the differentiation of the cells, both of these are true. So there's a, a level of diversity which is pre-encoded in the genome, but most of the diversity in antibody structure actually happens as the cells differentiate and, and mature. And um, this is why I'm always a little bit cautious about making statements that, oh, you know, all cells have got exactly the same genome in them. Now, to a first approximation, that's true. The vast majority of cells in your body have got an identical genome, with the exception, obviously, that they all carry different mutations. Um, but it's not true for cells of the immune system, or at least it's not true for the region around the loci that code for the antibodies, because those differ depending on which particular cell lineage uh, you're looking at. So there's several different ways in which this happens, both from what's present in the genome to begin with and then how that's um, organised. So one of the things that was realised very early on when people started sequencing the um, loci that encode different variable regions and, 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 and light chains and heavy chains um, was that the different domains which are present in those proteins are encoded in separate regions, uh, adjacent regions, but separate regions in the genome. And these are joined together by two things. One is by DNA rearrangements that take place as the cells differentiate, and the other is by mRNA splicing. And this gives rise to uh, one level of diversity, which is called combinatorial diversity. Now, this is best illustrated with a diagram. It's a complicated diagram, um, but it, it shows you what goes on as antibodies uh, are produced and as the cell lines differentiate. So if you look at the germline for light chains, and this is going to, I'm going to build on this. This is going to get more complicated. We're starting off with the simplest model first. You've essentially got um, a, a part of the antibody that encodes the variable region. There's also a leader sequence here. This is the leader sequence is needed to get the antibody into the secretory pathway. So that's the part of the protein that tells it to go into the endoplasmic reticulum and then eventually be secreted by the cells. So it turns out you have these, these three separate regions that finish up in the final protein, but which are separated on the genome. Uh, a variable region, a joining region, and a constant region. Heavy chains are stored is a bit more complicated. You've got a variable region, what's called a diversity region, a joining region, and then the different bits um, that make up the different um, domains, the, the, the three or four um, constant domains in the heavy chain, which is obviously bigger. Uh, now... The first thing that happens as these cells expressing these, um, or that are going to express these antibodies or B cell receptors, the same thing is true for the receptor proteins, by the way. As the cells begin to differentiate, there's actually a process that takes place before the genes are even transcribed where these different parts of DNA are brought together. So that's a recombination process. So essentially, if you look in um, a more mature cell, you'll see that the VG, the, the variable region and the joining region, uh, have been joined together, and this intermediate piece of DNA is just lost. It's, it's been cut out of the genome. Uh, that will then be transcribed, but then a splicing event will take place to remove this uh, region of the message here, this intron, and that will be your um, mature mRNA that is then translated to form the antibody. And essentially the same thing takes place within uh, the cells producing the heavy chain, or as, as the cell produces the heavy chain, uh, that these intermediate bits of DNA are, are physically cut out, so somatic recombination takes place, brings some of these domains closer, and then some of the other bits of, of um, DNA are removed, not at the DNA level, but by splicing of the message. So you've got a DNA re rearrangement taking place, and then you've got splicing of the message that takes place once the antibody is actually being um, transcribed. Now, you might think 
So how does that give us diversity? All you're doing is bringing pre-encoded domains closer together. And the reason it gives you diversity is this. If you actually look at the loci that encode the different sorts of heavy chain and light chain, there are multiple um, regions of DNA coding for slightly different domains. So if you take, and I, I've talked already about the lambda and kappa light chains, which are two different kinds of light chain. There are, uh, for the lambda chain, there's something like 30 different variable domains encoded in the genome um, and three different constant domains, each of which has got a joining domain between them. For the kappa light chains, uh, there's even more. There's over 40 variable domains, five uh, joining domains, although there's only one constant domain. For the heavy chains, it's even more crazy. You've got all these different potential variable domains here, all these different diversity domains, all these different junction domains, and then your different constant domains downstream. And the process of somatic recombination can bring together any variable domain with any joining domain and any constant domain. So it's not just the case that you're bringing uh, V lambda 1, J lambda 1, and C lambda 1 together. You might bring together V lambda 1, J lambda 2, C lambda 4, uh, or, or any, any combination like that. And as you can see, because you've got loads of variable domains and loads of constant domains and loads of joining domains, there's many different ways in which you can recombine those bits of DNA to, um, and, and do the splicing afterwards to produce um, diversity. So if we summarize that, if we look, and this is the human locus, this varies in different, different organisms, but at the human locus, between kappa and lambda, you've got something like 70 different variable domains physically encoded in the genome. Heavy chain, you've got around about 40. Uh, you don't have the diversity domains for the light, domains, uh, uh, the light um, chains, but you do have 25 or so diversity domains for the heavy chain, and you've got um, quite a number of different joining domains as well. So by, by mixing and matching these, you can generate, uh, clearly just from this step alone, you could generate 200 different sorts of antibody because you've got 40 different domains multiplied by five different joining domains. And you can do the maths yourselves and work out that just from um, recombining these in different ways, there's, there's many, many hundreds of different forms of antibody you could produce. Now, that's clearly not enough to account for the vast range of antibodies that there actually are, but it does show that um, even within the genome, there's a fair amount of variability encoded, and that variability is manifest by somatic recombination, rejoining the different domains at the genomic level, and then splicing at the, translation, at the transcriptional level, post-transcriptional post level. It turns out, however, that there's a, um, you can wrap this up a little bit because the process of joining the different domains together when somatic recombination takes place is not precise. So um, the enzymology of this leads to uh, sometimes the loss of a few nucleotides or the gain of a few nucleotides at the junction fragments. And so that's going to put even more diversity in there because you're going to have a few different amino acids at the junctions between the different domains. And as you might expect, this is referred to as junctional diversity. So you've got all the combinatorial diversity caused by joining the different domains together and then multiply that by the junctional diversity from the fact that the domain joins are made in slightly different ways, not always in the same way. You can also um, get different combinations of light and heavy chains formed in, in different cell types, uh, and that gives a little bit more diversity again. But the real um, place where most of the diversity comes from, and this, I think, is, um, I think this, this is the coolest bit to me, is that during the process of B-cell differentiation, when the B-cells have recognized an antigen, presented it to a T-cell, been stimulated to differentiate and mature, during that very, very rapid process of differentiation, the, um, a, a large amount of mutation takes place, and it particularly takes place in the CDR regions. Uh, so there's a switch to um, a form of error-prone DNA replication as these cells are very rapidly growing um, following their stimulation by the T cells. And this is really important because this means that you're starting off with a cell that's expressing an antibody which has got a reasonable degree of recognition. But as that cell replicates, grows, divides, um, it's throwing off lots of different variants some of which may recognize the antigen even better. 
because the mutation has taken place in one of the CDR regions that's enhancing its ability to recognize antigen. If that happens, that cell line is going to go through the whole process again of um, recognizing the antigen better, recognizing a T cell, and being stimulated even more. So during this process of B cell differentiation, it's not just that the B cell that recognizes the antibody really well is, is being multiplied up. It's that as it multiplies up, it's changing its ability to recognize the antigen, and those that recognize better are preferentially replicated. So you're in, improving the affinity of the antibody that the B cell will eventually produce when it differentiates into a plasma cell by this process of hypermutation. And this is really neat because what it essentially means is that the cell, that the body, the immune system starts off with something that may not recognize the antigen brilliantly, but as that replicates and grows and divides, its ability to recognize the antigen gets better and better and better. And the whole process of um, stimulation of cell growth is going to preferentially stimulate those cells that produce a receptor and eventually an antibody that recognizes the antigen as well as possible. Uh, there's also a process of gene conversion that takes place between the different variable encoding regions. And this simply means that um, within the genome, information can flow between different variable regions so that if you've got, um, say, five different variable regions, one of which has now been spliced into an antibody, that can still be changed by recombining with the other variable regions which are still present on the genome. So that's just another process of um, homologous recombination. So here's, here's um, diagrammatic result from a rather beautiful experiment which shows um, measurement of the amount of mutation that's taken place in genes encoding variable regions from the heavy chain and the light chain in a differentiating lineage of B cells. And we've gone from uh, the, the, the first stimulation um, to secondary response, tertiary response. This simply means that um, as we go through this process, the cells producing antibodies which are better and better and better at recognizing the antigen. And what you can see is this happens, um, mutations are arising in the lineage, and over the period of time, the ones in the CDR regions, mostly in the CDR, also elsewhere, but mostly in the CDR regions, are being selected for because presumably they're that little bit better at producing a protein, or they produce a protein which is that little bit better at recognizing the antigen. So by the time you get to three weeks in, the um, final sequence is really quite different from the initial sequence, and this cell will now be producing a very high affinity antibody indeed. So what it means essentially is that after B cell recognition has first taken place, that cell can continue to learn by an evolutionary process how to produce antibodies which have got better and better affinity for the antigen. The other thing that can happen uh, is a process called class switching, and class switching means that you can get wholesale changing of the constant regions. And that's important because it means that you might have a cell type Remember I said earlier on that the constant regions of the heavy change chains determine the class of the antibody that we're talking about. So you may have a B cell that's producing an IgG antibody with a very high affinity. That can then switch to producing an IgM antibody with exactly the same high affinity by swapping the constant regions between um, the different um, constant regions which are encoded on the genome. So... Here's a diagram that puts all, or some of this at least, together. Uh, here's the starting antibody. We can have gene conversion, which brings in different variable regions from different domains on the genome. We can have somatic hypermutation, particularly in the CDRs, which is going to increase the affinity of the ability of the antibody to recognize the antigen. Uh, we can have class switching, where the constant parts of the heavy chain change, so they've actually changed the class of antibody the cell's producing without changing its affinity for the antigen. So put all these things together, the somatic hypermutation, the functional, di the, the uh, junctional diversity, the combinatorial switching, um, the class switching, and now you can begin to get a sense of where the enormous diversity in antibody comes from. Combination of variability in the genome, variability in how that, uh, th those different regions are put together, um, things that take place after the antibody cell has matured by class switching, but I think most importantly, um, certainly most cool, uh, 
um, is the mutations that take place and are selected for during B cell differentiation. Isn't it good that that happens? Because without that, um, our immune systems wouldn't be anything like as effective, effective as they are. Okay, so you now know a little bit more about antibodies, um, how they recognize antigens, where that variability comes from, and how, um, once they recognize them, that process um, is, is followed by neutralization or opsonization um, and so on in order to clear the uh, offending item from, from the body. I'm not going to say a lot about antibody production because this is going to be something that will be covered more by, by Mike and Damon in subsequent lectures. But I want to say a little bit about it now because I want to um, uh, say something about monoclonals and, and where they come from. So classically, um, we use rabbits to make antibodies. Um, so you take your antigen, usually a protein, um, you'd purify it as much as possible, you'd inject it into some poor unsuspecting bunny, um, and then over a period of time, you would, you would collect blood from that, that bunny and you'd check, to, you'd check the blood and see whether um, within that blood there were antibodies that could now recognise your protein. Um, and this was um, you know, a pretty straightforward process. Um, eventually, the, the rabbit would be uh, what they um, call sacrificed, which means it would be killed, um, and you'd be given the blood. Uh, and the antibody wouldn't be particularly concentrated in that and it would be pretty messy because it would contain all the other antibodies that the rabbit was producing. Um, so it wouldn't be a brilliant reagent, uh, but it, it would work. And, you know, we worked a lot with these sorts of antibodies in the years, um, and still do to a certain extent, and it's, it's still quite a potent method that's used. It's a bit more complicated than this. Um, I'm going to spare you some of the details. Now, one of the interests... I'm just going to take a little bit of a sidestep here, which is that although rabbits were very, very widely used for um, making antibodies, or what we call antisera, which is essentially the blood when all the red blood cells have been taken out. Um, we don't just have to use rabbits. There are other animals that can be used as well. Um, as we'll see in a moment, mice are the main source for monoclonals. Um, but there's some interesting ones, like, for example, uh, camels and their relatives, like uh, things like llamas and so forth, um, produce slightly different antibodies to the ones that we produce. So a camel antibody uh, looks like this. And this is also true antibodies from, from llamas and whatnot. So here's a standard IgG of the kind that, that we produce. Um, camel antibodies don't look like that. They only have a heavy chain. They don't have a light chain as well. And these are actually simpler. They're, they're simpler molecules to make and produce because there's only two identical chains rather than two pairs of, of different chains. So um, people have explored the use of, of camelids, um, chickens, guinea pigs, goats, sheep, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever worked for The Binding Site, which is a big company up in Five Ways. I mentioned it the other week. I showed you the picture of the big um, IgG molecule etched into the glass of, of, of that company. Um, they use sheep and goats a lot to raise the anti serial that they work with. Um, actually, they, they, when I was there um, talking to some students a while ago, they were doing the immunizations in goat farms in the States um, and then shipping the serum back to the UK for purification in, in huge drums. So you'd have many, many litres of this stuff. Um, so you don't have to use rabbits uh, all the time to make your antibodies. There's lots of other organisms out there as well. Sorry. Yeah. Does anyone actually use camels or llamas? Llamas, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, of course, what one would often do, um, again, in, in the recombinant DNA era, is you might raise the antibodies there, but ultimately you want to purify the B cells clone the loci out of those B cells, and then you can express those antibodies in yeast or human cells, whatever you want. So we don't have in the animal house here camels or llamas, I'm afraid. Um, it's kind of a shame. It'd be, nice, it'd be cool if we did, but we've just got mice and rabbits and stuff like that. Um, it, would be, it would be sort of fun. Okay, so just to say a little bit about um, antibody use as reagents, if you're using antibodies to visualise things uh, or in diagnostics, you need something that tells you when the antibody is bound. Uh, and typically for this, you will have an antibody that recognises the antibody. And this would be called a secondary antibody. So that secondary antibody would probably have something conjugated to it, like a fluorescent marker or an enzyme activity that you can use to visualise the presence of the secondary antibody, which is bound to the primary antibody. Uh, so if you go into the catalogues from the companies that make antibodies, you'll have things like goat anti-rabbit, 
for example, which means um, it's serum from goats that recognises any, any rabbit antibody. Now, what that antibody will recognise is the FC region of the rabbit antibody. Okay, so any rabbit antibody will be recognised by that goat anti-rabbit antibody. Or you can have um, you know, rat anti-mouse or rabbit anti-mouse or mouse anti-rabbit and so on. Um, I'm not going to say more about their use in, in diagnostics or whatever because uh, we're more interested in their therapeutic use here. So when you have an anti-serum, it, it's, it's a really, really crude mix. So the, the classic way of making an antibody prep, as I said, would be to raise the antibody in a rabbit, bleed the rabbit, spin out the red blood cells and just take everything else. Or actually spin out the white blood cells as well and just take what's left. So that's the, the solution. Uh, there's loads of different proteins in there. There's lots of albumin, for example, uh, and lots and lots and lots of different antibodies. Now, um, that may not matter, because if your antibody is very specific for your antigen, the other antibodies aren't going to get in the way. But, but what you'd often see would be a lot of background. You know, some of the antibodies in there would recognise your antigen. Uh, you'd get messy signal, or you wouldn't be clear about whether the signal was what you wanted or not. Um, and the mixture would not only contain one antibody against your antigen, it might have a whole load of different antibodies that recognise different bits of your antigen, because every protein has got multiple epitopes on it. Some might have high affinity, some might have low affinity. The, um, the, the, the mixture itself is not very well defined. And this is what is often called a polyclonal antibody prep. And the, word, the expression polyclonal antibody can be a bit misleading, because polyclonal antibody implies an antibody that recognises lots of different epitopes. But that's not what it is. A polyclonal antibody is actually a mixture of a load of different antibodies that recognise different epitopes. So each individual antibody only recognises one particular epitope. A polyclonal antibody just contains a lot of those, all mixed up together. And you can imagine that these aren't great reagents. Even for diagnostic purposes, they'd be utterly hopeless for injecting into people because only a tiny part of what you'd be using is actually what you want. So you need a method of making um, an antibody that's pure and unique and doesn't have any other contaminating antibodies in it. And this is what's called a monoclonal antibody. So a monoclonal antibody simply means a preparation of just one antibody that recognises just one epitope. And these are enormously powerful reagents, and they were used as reagents in the lab and for diagnostics for many, many years. But now, as I pointed out in the first lecture, they're fantastically important um, therapeutics as well, and they're becoming very widely used as drugs. They're very, very expensive, which is why the drug companies like them, because it generates a, a staggeringly large amount of revenue for them. They're, in some cases, very effective. So conditions which for years have been untre pretty much untreatable, like rheumatoid arthritis, um, can now be treated quite successfully in many cases with things like Humira uh, and so on. So um, they really are transforming the therapeutic landscape for some conditions, uh, but they do come with a very heavy associated cost, so they're distorting the economic landscape of healthcare as well. So where do monoclonal antibodies come from? Uh, the idea is actually very simple, and this was um, Cesar Milstein at the MRC Labs in Cambridge uh, and George Curler who first had this idea. And I, I, I know somebody, uh, a friend of mine, who was working in the lab at the same time. Uh, so the MRC Labs at Cambridge is like sort of paradise for a molecular biologist. It, it, they don't know how many Nobel Prize winners have come from there, and um, it's a very, very vibrant place to visit. Uh, and they have a very famous tea room. Um, which, which is just a really... I'm not sure if it's still there, but it was there up to a few years ago. And you could walk into this tea room, get a cup of tea, and you kind of look around, and there's, that guy's got an FRS, and, and that woman's got an FRS, and that person's got a double chair at Oxford and Cambridge. Oh, and there's two Nobel Prize winners chatting over the coffee over there. It's an absolutely wonderful place to go to. Um, and I can remember um, this friend of mine who was there in the, in the 80s saying he'd sat down there for a cup of tea once, and, and Curler had come and sat down with him, because he knew him, said, oh, our experiment worked. And he said, oh, that's cool, yeah. Did you see the football last night? And, you know, it kind of went on talking about something else. And the experiment they'd done was to make the first ever monoclonal antibody-producing cell line, for which they subsequently got the Nobel Prize. So it's kind of a casual conversation over coffee, you know, less important than the fact that Arsenal had beaten Man U the previous night. 
Um, so the idea about making a monoclonal is that you want a cell that's producing an antibody and is immortal. It's going to keep on churning out that antibody over time. Now, the characteristic of producing an antibody is uh, what you get from a plasma cell, and plasma cells circulate all the way around the body, but they're particularly um, present in, in spleen. We've not talked about the organs involved in the immune system at all, but the spleen is very important in the immune response. But they're not immortal. If you isolate um, cell lines from spleen that are producing antibody, they'll go through a certain number of, of generations and then they'll die, which is what most cell lines, what primary cell lines um, will do. But you can, um, there are cell lines which are immortal, and, and by and large these are derived from um, tumour tissue because that's essentially what cancer is. It's, a, it's cells that have lost the ability to stop dividing. Uh, so the really kind of obvious idea, the very great idea that, that Milstein and Kerler had was let's take cell lines which are immortal, grow forever, but don't produce any antibody, and let's fuse them with, with cells that are not immortal but do produce antibody, and let's hope that from that we get a cell line that's immortal and produces antibody. Okay, so it's a, it's a pretty nice idea. And that's basically what they did. So they... Um, immunized mice uh, with a, their protein antigen. Um, they took out the spleen and they uh, created a primary line of spleen cells and among these cells would be many cells producing different antibodies that recognize um, antigen. Uh, they also took um, myeloma cells and the myeloma cells um, had a particular genetic mutation in them which meant that they couldn't grow on a, um, a certain kind of medium. <coughs> Uh, and they fuse the two together, and to do that, they just mix them with polyethylene glycol, which gets into membranes and, and tends to make membranes come together. Uh, and when you fuse cells, in some cases, not many, um, the nuclei will come together, the genetic material will mix, um, and you'll finish up with a cell line, which is essentially a chimera, or a hybrid of the two cell lines that you started with. They then put this onto a medium where these cells couldn't grow. And what that meant was that any unfused myeloma cells would die. They couldn't proliferate. These cells could grow, but of course they're, they're mortal. They're, they're, they're finite in their um, life cycle. So they go through a few cell divisions and then die. So the only cells that would be left, in theory, would be cells that represented fusions between these guys and these guys. And some of these, you would like to hope, would have picked up the gene for the um, antibody and would still be secreting the antibody. Of course, that's still a mixture at that point because your spleen cells will be producing antibodies with a range of different recognition capabilities. Um, what you then have to do is take um, that immortalized mixture of cell lines and then clone individual cell lines out of that by essentially diluting it down um, until you have cultures which have been seeded only by a single cell. Once you've done that, you screen the um, supernatants of these individual cells for their ability to bind to your antigen and you choose from that the one that's working as well as possible, um, and then amplify it up, and then you've got what's called a hybridoma, which is a cell line which is immortal. It'll keep on growing pretty much indefinitely, but it's churning out large amounts of an antibody that you want. And this is essentially how monoclonals are made. Now, of course, once you've got that hybridoma line, you can, if you want to, clone out the antibody loci and make the antibody somewhere else, um, the concentration of antibody in cell supernatant is not particularly high, um, but you can do some clever tricks with mice where you re-inject them back into the mice and, and collect um, fluid from the mice, which then has an extremely high concentration of antibody in. Uh, yeah, that's what's done here. So you can inject them into the peritoneal cavity of the mice and, and you get very high levels of antibody then produced. And... Um, these monoclonals are very useful. Um, they're, they're pure, uh, which means you don't, you know, you get far less problems with, with background and cross reactivity. Uh, you can, if you want, to clone the loci, express the proteins elsewhere, um, and if you've selected your um, cell lines carefully at, at, the, at the cloning stage, uh, they can have extremely high specificity and very high affinity for the antigen. So, um, both as reagents and more recently as drugs, they can be very useful indeed. Um, but it still doesn't solve the problem from a therapeutic point of view because, of course, a mouse antibody injected into a human will be recognised by a human as foreign. The FC region of a mouse is not the same. Uh, it, it's not the same as the human FC region, so we'll uh, reject the antibodies. We'll, we'll tend to 
um, neutralize those antibodies with our own immune systems. Now, that's not a problem at all if you're going to use them diagnostically. So if they're being used for uh, you know, pregnancy testing or some kind of early diagnosis uh, of disease or something like that, you can use mouse monoclonals um, absolutely fine. But if you want to use them therapeutically, you, you, you really can't. And although people did use them early on, their effectiveness would decline rapidly over time because the human immune system would recognize and remove those antibodies um, as soon as you injected them. But of course, using recombinant DNA methods, you can, you can combine any bit of DNA with any other bit of DNA. So you can start to do things like um, re-engineer the antibody so that you now just take the variable domain of the mouse gene and stick it onto the constant domain of the human gene. So now it looks a little bit more human because the FC domain is now human. That's got a double advantage. One is that it's not recognized as foreign as much anymore. The other, of course, is that now the human FC receptors are better at recognizing that antibody than they were at recognizing the mouse antibody. You can go even further than that, which is you can take the framework regions from human and graft those onto the CDR regions for mouse. So the only bits of the antibody that are mouse are the bits that recognize the antigen. And everything else in the antibody is human. And they're unlikely to be spotted as foreign by the human system because they look pretty human. You can go the whole hog, of course, um, which is instead of using um, mice to raise your antigen, you can uh, try to isolate human plasma cells that are expressing an antibody against the antigen and then just clone directly from that, in which case that's a fully human antibody. So here's a diagram um, showing the things I'm talking about. So, so mouse here is shown in red, um, human is shown in black. So that's a mouse antibody. Uh, we can make a chimeric one where we fuse the variable domains from mouse onto the constant domains from human. Uh, we can make what's called a humanized antibody, which means that everything is human apart from the CDR regions, which I hope you can see um, just shown as these little red lines here. Or you can have a, f a fully human antibody. And as you move away from the mouse antibody towards the human antibody, they become more and more valuable therapeutically because you get better recognition by the human immune system of the FC region and less tendency to recognize them um, as foreign molecules. So that's um, shown a thing quite nicely here. So this, this um, is the same diagram, essentially mouse, chimeric, humanized, and, and fully human. Um, this top line shows what, what percentage of the molecule is human, what percentage is mouse. So 0% human here, 100% here. Um, how often, if you're going to use these therapeutically, how often do you have to keep on using them? It's very high. Um, if it's a mouse antibody, um, it's low. Uh, if it's a human antibody, um, how often, um, how, how effective is the repeated administration? It, it, it's, it's poor here because um, the immune system is going to provoke an immune response, um, where it's, it's pretty good with the human ones. And how well do they work? Um, this is going right back to um, cell-mediated cytotoxicity that we talked about right in the first lecture, I think. Uh, it's not that great with mouse antibodies because they're not recognized by the FC receptors. It's really high with human antibodies. So therapeutically, you want to be on this end of the spectrum, clearly. And um, there's a convention in the naming of these antibodies. You'll you go right back to the very first slide we had. Um, last week, you'd, you'd have noticed the, the actual names of these antibodies, and they all um, finish, or they should finish, if people follow the conventions, with these different suffixes. So OMAB means it's a mouse antibody, ZIMAB means it's a chimeric, ZUMAB means it's humanized, and UMAB means it's human. So by looking at the trade name of a therapeutic, which is based on an antibody, and looking at the suffix, you can tell whether it's fully humanized or chimeric um, or, or whatever. You probably won't see mouse antibodies um, being produced as therapeutics. So that's part of where the name of the antibody actually comes from. Okay, I think we're pretty much done. Um, just that very last slide, sorry, let's just go through that again. This is what you should be able to do now, I hope. Um, you should be able to talk about what the different kinds of therapeutic biologicals are with an emphasis on the antibodies. Um, in terms of their therapeutic uses, Mike will talk a lot more about that and we'll compare them to small molecule drugs and, and tell you some stories um, about what's been going on there. Um, 
the biological background, so how do cells generate antibodies, where does the diversity come from, um, I've covered in quite a lot of detail, and how are they actually made, so commercially, how do you produce these things on a big enough scale to be useful, um, Damon Hoover will cover that in his lectures as well. So that's me done for now, uh, and I'll see you again on this module when we come to the workshop on flow cytometry. DJ, you have a question? Yeah. Um, sorry, you're talking about the peritoneal production yeah. with mice. They, they don't go back into the circulation. The peritoneal cavity is, is not part of the circ circulatory system. So you basically inject them subcutaneously. And what you then get is um, high pro proliferation of those cells, which are churning out antibody. But the antibody physically gets maintained in the peritoneal fluid. You then drain off the peritoneal fluid, and that's got very high concentration of the antibody in. But they're not going back into general circulation at that point. And that's not something that can be done, like, in the lab? I don't think any antibodies are produced commercially that way because it would just be too laborious. Uh, but in terms of producing perhaps some monoclonals for use uh, in the lab, you know, someone's making a monoclonal for you to use in an immunoprecipitation or a Western, they may very well do it that way. The, the fluid is called acidic fluid or ascitic fluid, and that's just the nature of the fluid that you get accumulating when you do a subcutaneous injection into the peritoneal cavity. All right. Anybody else? Any questions? Okay, great. Thanks very much, guys.